Hi, Laura. I'm new to the podcast, and I've been going through episodes. I'm looking for specific types of advice. I have not invested yet. I am 36, so I know that I'm late to the party, but I want to start now and open a brokerage account. I've been trying to figure out which is the best option, whether it's Fidelity or Vanguard, etc., I haven't been able to find a previous episode on that topic, and that would be great if you can make a new episode on that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Anonymous caller, thank you so much for your question. I'll review eight considerations for investing in a brokerage account in this show. We'll cover tips for choosing a firm, selecting investments, and managing money wisely based on your financial goals. Hey friends, welcome back to the Money Girl podcast. I'm Laura Adams, an award-winning author and money expert who's been bringing you tips and advice weekly since 2008 with over 41 million downloads. My most recent title, Money Smart Solopreneur, a personal finance system for freelancers, entrepreneurs, and side hustlers, was a number one Amazon new release. Be sure to check it out if you are thinking about starting a small business or you're doing some side work off of your day job, or maybe you already have a business that you want to take to the next level. If you have a money question or a suggestion for a show topic, I'd love to hear it. You can do just like our anonymous caller did and call 302-364-0308 to leave a voice message, or you can use my contact page at lauradadams.com to send me an email. All right, if you're like the anonymous caller and you feel like you're getting a late start to investing, I want to assure you that you're not. There is no wrong time to start investing because everybody is on a unique financial journey. I didn't start investing regularly until my early 30s when my husband and I successfully sold a business and we had a nice profit that we needed to put somewhere. I think many people procrastinate investing because maybe they think it's too complicated or too risky or too time-consuming. So I want to congratulate the caller for asking the question and getting serious about your financial future. I'm going to explain exactly how to get started as an investor. So we're going to cover eight things you should know about investing in a brokerage account. Let's get into it. Number one you should have a financial safety net. Before you invest money in a taxable brokerage account or even a tax-advantaged retirement account, be sure to have healthy savings. Remember that saving and investing are two different things. You save money to preserve it for short-term needs, things like emergencies or maybe you want to buy a car in a few years. Savings should never be invested. You want to keep your savings bucket entirely safe in an FDIC-insured savings account or a FDIC money market account so it will never lose value. And if you have a hardship like losing your job or business income, maybe you have some unexpected medical bills, having that cash reserve is going to be a lifeline to keep you from having a lot of money stress or relying on debt. If you don't have an emergency fund yet, a good target is to save three to six months worth of your living expenses. And these include things like housing, food, utilities, debt payments, you know, just kind of the basics to run your life. For example, if your living expenses total $4,000 monthly, you would want to make a goal to build up a minimum of $12,000 in savings. That would give you a three-month reserve. But you might need a little less or even a little more, depending on your family situation and your financial goals. However, investing is best for goals you want to achieve in at least three to five years in the future. They might include buying a home, paying for a child's college, and of course, retiring. With investing, you put money into financial instruments like mutual funds, expecting future growth. Investing is not appropriate for short-term goals because market values can fluctuate wildly within the short term, and the value of that account could plummet right when you need the money. So investing is for long-term goals. It does require some risk, 
But without taking some risk, you're not likely to earn enough growth to achieve significant financial goals like retiring. A good rule of thumb is to invest a minimum of 10 to 15% of your gross income for retirement every year, and maybe more if you've got other long-term goals. The second thing to know about investing in a brokerage account is that you should invest sooner rather than later. I always say that starting small is better than not at all when it comes to investing. No matter how much or little money you have, it's better to start investing sooner so your money begins growing. I want you to consider two people who invest the same monthly amount and receive the same average annual return on their investment. The first is Sarah. She begins investing at age 35 and stops at age 65. So she's got 30 years of investing. And over those 30 years, she invests $400 a month and receives an average return of 7%. When she's ready to retire, her account balance is going to be less than $500,000. The second investor is James. He begins investing at age 25 and stops at age 65. So he invests $400 a month, receives the same average return of 7%, but he's investing for 40 years. And so James ends up with just over a million dollars once he's ready to retire. So by starting to invest 10 years earlier than Sarah, James gets to retire a millionaire with over a half a million dollars more to spend than Sarah does, even though he only invested $48,000 more out of his pocket. That's $400 a month times 12 months times 10 years. So he only invested $48,000 more than Sarah, but ended up with $500,000 more in his account to spend in retirement. James has a much higher account balance because his money had more time to compound and grow. So even if you don't have $400 a month to spare, I want you to start investing some amount right now if you're not doing it already. As you earn more money, you can invest more. And when you have a windfall, maybe you get a cash gift, a bonus at work, or even a tax refund, you can invest that money too. Waiting for the perfect time to invest causes you to lose significant earnings. And just saying, well, I'll catch up later on, doesn't typically work because it's going to be extremely challenging and costly to try to catch up later. So never forget that the sooner you start investing regularly, the more wealth you can build with less effort. The third thing to know about investing in a brokerage is that you should maximize tax-advantaged accounts first. The anonymous caller didn't say whether they want to open a taxable or a tax-advantaged account within a brokerage, such as an individual retirement account or IRA. Since they didn't mention investing in a workplace retirement plan, I'm going to assume that they don't have one or maybe they're self-employed. Unlike retirement accounts, taxable brokerage accounts require you to pay tax annually on any capital gains. That's the profit that you get from selling an investment for more than its purchase price. You also have to pay tax on any interest and dividend income that you earn annually. The tax amount depends on how long you own the investment and your tax bracket. But the upside of taxable accounts is getting lots of flexibility. Unlike retirement accounts, they don't have income requirements, annual contribution limits, early withdrawal penalties, or any required minimum distributions. Nor do they have any protections from creditors under federal and some state law, like some types of workplace retirement plans. So there are pros and cons to each. Both taxable and tax-advantaged retirement accounts allow you to choose various securities, but taxable accounts typically have the broadest range of options. When you purchase investments using a retirement account, like an IRA or a SEP IRA, that's for the self-employed, you build wealth for retirement and reduce your taxes at the same time. So I recommend that the anonymous caller open up a retirement account inside a brokerage and maximize it first before putting money in a taxable account. The fourth thing to know 
is that you should know the retirement account rules. Everyone with earned income, even minors, qualify for a traditional IRA. With that account, you make pre-tax contributions and defer taxation until you make withdrawals in retirement. There are no income limits to qualify for a traditional IRA. And if you're married and file taxes jointly but have no income because maybe you're a stay-at-home spouse, you can invest based on your spouse's income. For 2023, you can contribute up to $6,500 or $7,500 if you're over 50 to a traditional IRA. The annual contribution limit is the same for a Roth IRA, but a Roth IRA has a qualifying income limit. For 2023, you must earn less than $153,000 as an individual taxpayer or less than $228,000 as a married couple filing taxes jointly to qualify to make Roth IRA contributions. But again, with a traditional IRA, there are no income limits. With a Roth IRA, you pay tax up front on your contributions. And that means you don't get a tax deduction for them. However, you get tax-free growth and tax-free withdrawals of your original contributions and the account earnings when you're in retirement, which is a fantastic benefit. In addition to investing through a traditional or Roth IRA, you've got more account choices if you're self-employed. Two popular accounts are a SEP IRA and a SOLO 401k. They have higher contribution limits than IRAs, like up to $66,000 based on how much you earn and your age. So you want to look into those if you have any business income. Number five, you should choose a diversified investment portfolio. Buying and selling individual securities like stocks and bonds is not a wise strategy for the average investor. That's because no one can predict whether their values will go up or down. While no other mainstream investment outperforms stocks, their prices can be volatile, rising and falling daily or even minute to minute. A better strategy is to invest in one or more diversified funds, which bundle investments. So they bundle things like stocks, bonds, and assets, plus additional securities, making them really convenient for investors to purchase. They may focus on one asset class, such as large domestic companies, or have a mix of them. Investment funds are incredibly diversified because they comprise hundreds or even thousands of underlying securities, like stocks, bonds, currencies, and real estate. Diversifying is key because it allows you to earn higher average returns while reducing risk. That happens because if some securities within a fund lose value, some will hold steady or increase in value, which minimizes your potential losses. Since the 1920s, the historical average return of the stock market has been approximately 10%. So if you have decades to go before you retire, I want you to consider investing a large percentage of your portfolio in stock funds. Stock prices will indeed fluctuate during the short term, but prices are likely to increase over the long term, giving you an excellent return on your investment. But even if you only earned an average 7% return on your investments, you'd have a nest egg worth just over a million dollars after investing $400 a month for 40 years, like James in my previous example. If you put that money in a high-yield savings account instead of investing, saving $400 a month for 40 years with a meager 3% return would result in about $370,000. So you can see the power of investing versus saving. Okay, the sixth thing to know is that you should understand investment funds. In addition to stock funds, there are different types and categories of funds you should get familiar with. Mutual funds are a collection of assets managed by a fund professional. Buying and selling shares on a mutual fund are restricted to the end of the trading day when the fund's net asset value gets calculated. Exchange-traded funds, or ETFs, are similar to mutual funds in that they are baskets of assets. However, they trade more like individual stocks, meaning you can buy or sell ETF shares throughout the day and expect price fluctuations throughout the day as well. Index funds are mutual funds that usually come with low fees 
and may comprise thousands of underlying investments. Index funds aim to match or outperform a specific index, such as the Standard & Poor's 500 Index or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Target date funds are mutual funds that automatically reset the mix of assets in their portfolio according to your set time frame, such as the date you plan to retire. Be aware that funds come with different fees known as an expense ratio. For example, a 1% expense ratio means that 1% of the fund's assets will be used for paying yearly expenses, like management and advertising. Generally, choosing lower-cost funds, like ETFs and index funds, is best to avoid unnecessary costs that can eat away at your investment returns. Number seven you should choose a brokerage based on your needs. Choosing the right brokerage can make a huge difference in your investing experience. First, consider whether you'll want a taxable account, retirement account, or both. And make sure the firm offers the type of retirement account you want, such as an IRA or a solo 401k for the self-employed. Then consider your investing preferences, like do you want to choose your own investments or do you want to use a robo-advisor or do you want help from a human advisor? Some brokerages offer free advice and others charge for that assistance. A robo-advisor manages your portfolio automatically based on features you select, such as your stated risk tolerance, age, and financial goals. It's essentially an algorithm that is going to recommend a diversified portfolio, which is typically a mix of 5 to 10 exchange-traded funds. And it can rebalance the portfolio, ensuring your desired asset allocation gets maintained over time. Because trading is automated, robo-advising platforms typically charge lower fees than human advisors. However, some brokerages will offer a hybrid model where you can consult with a human professional for more advanced financial planning advice. You should definitely consider a firm's investing fees based on the type of advice that you want or need. Also, think about, do they have a great app and a user experience that makes investing intuitive and enjoyable? And can you reach out to somebody if you have questions? Do they have additional services like banking products that you might use? As with any financial decision, you want to do your homework to compare brokerages and consider your unique circumstances and preferences. Number eight, you should ignore what you can't control as an investor. Drops in the stock market are uncontrollable, so don't drive yourself crazy by focusing on unavoidable actual or potential losses in your investments. Instead, I want you to stay focused on building wealth over the long term using a buy and hold strategy. What happens in the financial markets from day to day only matters if you need to liquidate your investments during the same period. In other words, you need to ignore media hype, and stock tips from friends and never make rash decisions, such as selling your investments right when their value drops. Your goal should be to get investment growth over decades, not month to month or even year to year. Remember that money you need or want to spend in the short term should not be invested. It should be saved. If you're unsure how to choose investments, don't hesitate to seek advice from people like your benefits department at work, a brokerage account representative, or an independent financial advisor. And if you don't understand what a professional tells you, you don't understand their explanations or recommendations, keep asking questions until you do. You're going to be glad you did, especially when you build a healthy nest egg that gives you peace of mind and financial security. A big thanks to the anonymous caller, and I hope this helps you choose a brokerage and move forward with your investing strategy. You're at a great time in life to begin, so don't feel like you're behind the eight ball. There's really never a bad time to get started. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week. Until then, here's to living a richer life. Money Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Steve Rickyberg with editing by Adam Cecil. Our advertising operations specialist is Morgan Christensen. Our digital operations specialist is Holly Hutchins. And our marketing and publicity associate is Davina Tomlin. Hey.